and welcome to the Mid-American Gardener Show. We're glad that you've joined us. My name is Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois, but not in the summer. So I'm all gardening all the time. And that's what we're here to do is talk about anything to do with landscape and the garden. Um, I teach in the crop sciences department. And so when I'm teaching, sometimes I talk about perennials, cut flowers, um, so those are my areas, but I'm going to introduce our three highly intelligent panelists here and let you know what their expertise is in, and then questions can be directed that way. Let's start first with you, Mike Brunk. Okay, I'm known as the City Arborist. I work for the City <laughs> of Urbana. I've been with them for about 30 years. My specialty is trees. That says it all. And do you have an email or something for I do. us? I'll read an email. And uh, it's titled Silver Maple Spot. So um, this particular sample that was sent in has uh, two different leaves here. And the question is, what could be the cause of these gross black spots on my silver maple? And the tree's probably at least 60 years old. Well, you have two issues here. Um, the little red raised dots are uh, bladder gall mite uh, on the maple and the black larger dots is uh, tar spot. Now both of these are an aesthetic problem. They won't harm the tree. It's best to keep the fallen leaves up, cleaned up, and that will help reduce the black tar spot, which is a fungal problem. Uh, the bladder gall mite is a little insect. Uh, there are parasitic uh, insects that can feed on those mites, so it's not recommended that you spray the tree with any kind of insecticide, uh, but just keep the leaves picked up from underneath. That's probably the best thing you can do. And keep the tree vigorous, so if we go into a droughty period this summer, uh, water, uh, water your tree uh, in the morning. That was really interesting to have two different things and then you can compare them. And yeah, they're both common. In fact, the past okay. couple of years, tar spot's been real, real common in, okay. in maples. I'll have to look for it now. Hmm. I hope I don't find it. I've All always right. wondered how you can go out and cut down a perfectly good spruce tree or something like that, hang red balls on it and it's pretty, but you get red balls on your maple tree and that's mm. ugly. Gee, this is a philosophical question. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. Something to ponder. <laughs> okay, I will not, I mean, I will, I will ponder that. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. And let's go on to the lady in the middle, Paula Blakely. Hi, my name is Paula and I am with Align IFS Farm Town and I like talking about vegetables and gardening and anything plant related. Excellent. And you brought something beautiful. Well, June is pollinator month. And so we brought in a pollinator pot that has some perennials and annuals, herbs, and just various flowers. And that's our little, you know, ode to the pollinator month. And the beautiful pink one in the front. Monarda bee balm. Which yeah. one is that? That's which Monarda, this one? Is which called bee balm? I don't know. Oh, you well, it's beautiful. I, I it's don't a red know one. the cultivar. It's, it's, a, it's a red cultivar. It's a pinky, pinky, it's the it red one. It's the red one. red one. Looks pink to me. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it looks pink to me. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to bring up was the pollinator pockets. This is a program through the University of Illinois Cooperative Extension, and they have a great website. You can go there. You can figure out what plants work well for you. Mm -hmm. You can put that into a garden, and then you can send through the right paperwork, and you can have your garden registered and receive a wonderful little sign to put right next to all your plants. Me. Excellent. That's a very official sign too. It's very official. Yeah. Nice. Well, very good. Thank you for bringing those. That's, that's a beautiful plant, uh, pot and it's going to do, do a lot of good work too. Okay. Well, let's go to the, the fellow right next to me, Dr. Phil Nixon. Take it away, Phil. Hi, I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois, which means I do bugs. And uh, I have a question here from a viewer. It says, for several years, my green ash tree has shown signs of deterioration. The attached pictures show parts of a trunk losing bark, which falls around the base of the tree. Some of the bark seem to fall overnight. Does this look like an emerald ash borer infestation? Well, what it looks like to me is that you have uh, somebody looking for an emerald ash borer infestation because generally the way, a good way to determine whether you have eighth inch wide uh, D-shaped holes 
on the trunk of a tree is to shave the bark down with a pocket knife or something like that and that exposes a true shape. You can take almost any little crack or crevice or hole in the, in the rough bark and if you stare at it long enough you can make it look like an eighth inch wide D-shaped hole. But when you shave it down like the pictures show then it's, uh, then it's very obvious and so I think that may be what's happened is particularly if it's a street tree somebody has been checking it for emerald ash borer and, and didn't pick up the divots on the ground so uh, the, sh the uh, shavings and I think that's probably what it is because I've never seen woodpeckers do that uh, and ash tends to hold on to its bark a lot better than some things like maple or hickory where you or uh, or sycamore where you will get pieces of bark falling to the ground so I think what your uh, your perpetrator here is is a human with a pocket knife and they were just looking for emerald ash borer <laughs> That is really interesting. Hey, you, you know, you got to think of all ideas. Yes, to fill. and someone did not pick up their divots. Yeah. <laughs> or their shards, as the case may be. Yes, you. that's true. Well, thank you. That's an interesting uh, viewer question as well. Well, let's go to the Did You Know video next. The oil inside a banana peel will reduce the itching and inflammation from a mosquito bite. So if you get a bug bite, try rubbing a banana peel on it. In this case, I just read it. I didn't research it, but I thought that was kind of interesting. It is. As long as you like the smell of banana. And okay. you're not allergic like me, it would make me have a oh, big rash. Oh, well but then don't do that. Yeah, I won't do that. But very interesting. All right, let's go to the phone lines next. <laughs> and on line two, Carol has a question about moms. Hi, Carol. Are you there? Line two, Carol. Oh, I so want to answer this question too. Not there. Well, we hope we get her back. Otherwise, we're going to answer her question. She put a little info uh, on the monitor so we can read it. So hopefully Carol comes back. But let's then go to line four. And Gloria has a plant question as well. Hello, Gloria. Hi, how you doing? Doing great. What's your question? Okay, my house plant has some little white, uh, I guess it's kind of like little small cotton stuff on it, but it's sticky, and my plant seems to be dying. Okay, is the white fuzz kind of where at the uh, joints in the, in the branches or where the leaf uh, attaches to the, to the uh, stem? Yes. That uh, would probably be mealybugs, which are a sucking insect. Uh, you end up with little, when, when they're full grown, you end up with a white patch uh, or a white fuzz ball, probably about, oh, maybe up to a quarter, eighth to a quarter of an inch in diameter, and you get several together, it can even get bigger ones. And they're sucking the juice out of the plant. Uh, there are a couple options that you can look at. One, one reasonably good option, option if your plant is relatively small and, uh, and you don't mind getting your fingers dirty is to pick off the uh, uh, the white fuzzies and uh, and then and then uh, spray the plant with an ins with insecticidal soap and insecticidal soap will be sold that way in a garden center and then uh, and then if you see more showing up repeat the process in fact it wouldn't be a bad idea to do it a couple free weeks in a row about a week apart because you're primarily killing the young crawlers that are hatching out from the from the mealy bugs. If it's a larger plant or you don't really want to go that direction, there you can use a, a systemic insecticide uh, for house plants that are labeled for house plants. It will be an amatoclopred product, but you'll find it as a as a as a systemic insecticide uh, labeled for house plants, and that will do an excellent job on them as well. A combination works even better, getting rid of some of the big, uh, big mother uh, 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 mealy bugs first, and then uh, and then following up with a with a systemic insecticide, which is applied to the soil and watered in, and it will provide several months of control. Okay, very good, and thank you for your question. We would like to go to line five, and I hope that we can catch up with Carol again. Carol, what is your question about moms? Line five. Oh, my question about moms is my moms are two feet high, and I'm wondering if it's too late to cut them back. Um, normally, the rule of thumb is July 4th. Yep. So pinch, pinch them back, and and do it to shape it. 
And normally you want to start when it's a little bit shorter, but things happen. So, but do pinch them back and it, when they're that tall, they've probably stretched some, so you might want to pinch right on top of two leaves. So don't pinch in the middle, but pinch right above two leaves. Uh, Polly, you want to add anything to that? No. <laughs> I think we got it covered, but yeah. do pinch it to yeah, shape. It's not too late <clears throat> at all. No. But if you do it in July, then what will happen, late, late in July, then the response, the, you know, 10, 9, 11 week response, the mums will flower too late. So make sure you cut it off July 4th. Okay, thank you. I'm glad that we got your question in. Uh, we're needing some more questions. We have one more to go, but if you have a question about your garden, give us a call. Now let's go to line three, and it's a question uh, to do with the turf, with the lawn. Hi, line three. Hi. What's your question? I have a question about grass fleas. Have you ever heard of them? Well, the only f fleas that I know of are commonly in the grass. They are they're cat fleas most of the time. They'll occur on dogs and and uh, and wild mammals as well as uh, as well as cats. But uh, but I don't know of uh, what people would be calling grass fleas per se. But uh, essentially, when somebody talks about fleas or sand fleas, they're talking about the same insects and uh, probably grass fleas you know, would be just regular fleas uh, that, uh, that could, could get on you and, and, and come inside and lay eggs and become a problem indoors that might, would need some treatment to get rid of. But uh, generally, uh, uh, wild animals coming through the lawn will drop off fleas and they could build up that way. Now, a common insect in turf are leaf hoppers, and as you walk across the turf, they will fly, jump and fly in front of you but they, but fleas can only jump, leaf hoppers jump and fly, and that may be what they're referring to, but I have never, ever heard them called grass fleas before. Uh, they're sucking insects on the turf, and for the most part don't cause any harm to the turf. Might cause a few yellow spots, but nothing that's important enough to worry about treating. So uh, if you're walking across the turf and you're seeing little things kind of jump and fly in front of your feet, those are probably leaf hoppers. But if they're landing on to you and looking real dark and and uh, and sucking your blood, then those are fleas. I, I know farther south, in about a week or so, the chiggers are going to start coming out. So they they and you pick those up in tall grass. Yeah. Yeah. yeah chiggers are more common in tall grass. They're the larval stage of a mite that uh, that can can burrow into the skin and and cause a reaction. But uh, and those are re those are repelled with repellents. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Let's go to a question about zucchini, and this time it's on line six with Evelyn. Hi there, Evelyn. Hello. What is your this question? Is Evelyn. Uh, my question is, we had a zucchini plant, and it was already bearing zucchinis, and yesterday it looked like it was dying, and today it's gone. We, we cut it, we dug it up, we cut out the to see if there was a bore. We went online to see if there was a bore in. You didn't find one, did you? No. I didn't expect you to, because the moth, had, that the uh, squash borer moth flies in the first half of June, and typically you're not going to get bore damage until in July at some point, so, and, and later. So uh, typically we, uh, we would not have uh, any borers in it this early. So I'm not, I'm not sure what would be causing the plant to die. Was, was the stem intact? Evelyn, are you still with us? I am. Was okay. the stem I, intact? Yes. Okay. And I have another zucchini plant real close to it, and it's fine. Oh. Well, there are several things that can cause a plant to kind of, kind of go south all of a sudden. One is, is that if you happen to have an anthill right at the base of it, they will, although they don't feed on the plant, they will loosen the soil around it to where uh, the roots can, can dry, die, dry up and die, and that mm. can cause the death of, of, of a plant. Uh, you might have had uh, uh, some, a, uh, 
Pythium or Phytophthora associated diseases associated with the roots or the stems that could cause some problems, particularly if it, if it was kept pretty damp and, and wet. Generally with zucchini, you hill them up uh, uh, on the hills to help improve drainage and reduce the likelihood of, uh, of some of these water molds of, a, of attacking the plant and causing death. That could be another thing, and then you start getting into even farther afield. In other words, there are a variety of reasons why one plant would die. Uh, as long as you've got good drainage and, uh, and so on, I think you're probably not likely to see the one next to it go out. Well, I hope not. Yeah, and hope probably not too. one plant. One plant's probably going to give you a bell load of plenty. zucchini anyway, so that'll be good enough. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you, Evelyn, for your question. And we all learn that the hard way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you plant two or three, well, you're just trying to figure out who's going to take your zucchini, making little steps. Well, anyway. All right, let's go back to uh, you, Mike, and do you have a, a second email? I do. Okay, this email, um, I've taken a guess on it because the individual's talking about an autumn fire plant. Well, autumn fire is a trade name for perennials plants, uh, numerous perennial plants. Uh, it's also a trade name for a Japanese maple. It's a trade name for an azalea. And due to the question, I chose to answer this as though this plant was an azalea. So I bring that out just to tell the audience that if you do uh, have a question about a plant, make sure you let us know what species it is and what the specific plant is uh, along with the name. So the question is, our autumn fire is huge already. I need some advice. It looks like it may start to bloom soon. If I'm not mistaken, uh, can I, should I cut back? And how? I have to wire. Uh, I have to wire to fence because it gets too or so tall. Um, so to answer your first question, can you cut it back? Yes, you can. Should I? Uh, not if there's really no reason to cut it back. Uh, woody plants uh, generally, you like to let them grow to their natural state. Uh, and if you decide to cut it back, can I? Or how? How can you? In azaleas, you want to cut them back right after they bloom and you want to use a good pair of sharp pruners and you want to cut the stems back to another lateral stem so it's best not to shear the plant uh, to keep its natural form you want to trim stem by stem uh, back to the next lateral and you can reduce it down little by little or maintain it uh, that way but this is actually if this is a, the autumn fire azalea it's a dwarf plant so uh, literature says it's only three feet tall three feet wide so uh, look at your tag if you still have that, determine what size it is, and then you can determine whether you, you need to prune it or not. But if you don't need to prune it for any specific reason, don't. That's what I would suggest. Okay, very good, because I'm not sure exactly which autumn fire, but, but it's interesting about the azalea, so thank There's you. autumn fire, this is sedum. Uh, yeah. There's an autumn fire, Japanese maple. Okay. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, azalea that has a two and a half, three inch bloom. Okay, well, and thank it takes, you. And it takes more sun, uh, this particular azalea, than most. Which is good to know Yeah. for other folks who don't have the shade. All right, let's go to you next, Paula. All right. My caller says that I live in Cortland, Illinois, and last summer this plant grew in my garden. By the end of fall, it was about 12 feet tall and had orange spiked balls on it. I opened a ball and it had seeds shaped like beans. I have no idea what kind of plant this is. Can you help me? I think she's got a castor bean plant, and this might be the spiky balls that she's talking about. That is its flower, and it does have a bean-shaped seed. Um, the castor bean plant is uh, not actually a bean. It's in the spurge family. It is in the Euphorbiaceae family. All parts of the plant is poisonous, but I think like anything in the garden, you, discretion, you know, you're not gonna go around just eating them, and I don't think that they're gonna um, cause a lot of damage just by handling them. Um, the seed and the leaves of the plant contain a toxin called ricin, and the plant is native to the Mediterranean. It can be grown here as a summer ornamental, and yes, the castor oil is derived from the seed, Growing it is not illegal. For a few years, we couldn't get the seed in, but it is available again. And um, But trying to extract or process the plant is illegal. Well, I would not recommend that at all. But it's a beautiful ornamental plant. 
gets really big. It's gorgeous. And your bee balm is called Pardon My Pink. Pardon my pink. I found the tag. Mike, it is pink. You and I were right. <laughs> okay. But it looks a little reddish under these lights. So <laughs> thank you. Pardon my pink. That's cute. Okay, let's go next to you, Phil. We have a, uh, a caller from Facebook. Lyle says, I am a first-time grower of broccoli, Rob. Something is eating the leaves. I inspected the plant and cannot find hide nor hair of any insects. I dusted the plants of a little seven. Anyone else have the same problem? Well, anybody who grows broccoli, broccoli rab, cauliflower, cabbages, uh, Brussels sprouts, uh, collards, all of these have the same problem because they all get uh, two or three different kinds of caterpillars, the most common one being uh, imported cabbage worm. Uh, that will blend in very well with the foliage. There's cabbage looper, there's diamondback moth. Uh, all of these plants have some of the same uh, secondary chemicals in them that keep other types of insects from feeding on them, but these do a very good job on it. We normally recommend dusting them once you see the white butterflies flying around, which is the adult stage of the imported cabbage worm, to, to dust the, the plants w or spray the plants with Bacillus thuringiensis kirstaki, BTK, commonly sold as Dipel, Thuricide, and a whole raft of other brand names. And do that about every two weeks or so to, uh, to keep, the, uh, keep the caterpillars down. Carboreal sold as seven will also work much of the time, although you could run across some resistant uh, ones associated with that insecticide. Uh, but the, the BTK is neat because you don't necessarily have to remember when you put it on because it's completely non-toxic to people and other mammals. So uh, it's, it's a good thing and it's a very timely thing because the butterflies are out flying already right now, laying their eggs and the, and the, and the caterpillars are chewing up your, your coal crops. Oops. <laughs> yes, and they blend in, that's for sure. I used floating row cover one year and really grew great cabbage. It was, it was fine. So but you don't always think to do that in the right timing. All right, let's go to line two, and we're gonna to talk to Dennis. He has a question about grapes. Hi, Dennis. Hi, uh, last year a uh, black spot appeared on about half of my uh, uh, grape crop, and it appears to be happening again this year. I wanted to know what's causing it, and how do I fix it? Were these on the grapes themselves, or the leaves, or both? They're on the grape. Hmm. The black spot is on the grape. I'm going to take a wild stab, unless somebody knows better. And I think that grapes are fairly uh, susceptible to botrytis, which will show up as black spots as the grapes ripen. And generally, botrytis and, and other fungi, it could be another fungus that would be causing this. I'm not an expert in this area by any stretch of the imagination, but I do know that fungi need moisture. And if you prune your grapes properly back in the dormant season, so because grapes need to be pruned back considerably, then you have a more open, airy plant that'll, that allows more, more uh, air to get in, more wind, and helps reduce these types of problems. And to, and to top it all off, you end up with fewer, larger grapes. And so you end up getting bigger grapes as a result. And the University of Illinois Extension has information on how to properly prune your grapes. They have, they would have it on a website. You can contact your local office and they can help you out on that. Surprisingly severe pruning is what grapes need. Mm -hmm. It is surprisingly severe. All right, let's do one more question. We're gonna to go to Marlene's question about daylilies <coughs> on line four. Hi, Marlene. Hi, Diane. I have two bushes of, I think they're Stella de Oro. Yes, and uh -huh. the last couple of years, they just haven't flowered. Do you have full sun? One does, the other one has some shade. Okay. Do you fertilize? No. Okay, Sometimes good. It's good. probably good. Yeah. yeah, that's really a good idea. Cause <laughs> to it not will, fertilize. They will not flower well with fertilization. And they could be planted too, I mean, are they too big of a plant? Do you, do yeah. Daylilies like iris, are they like irises where they will quit blooming if they're too packed into uh, are one they area. Older? Yeah. Are they older? Well, they plant? have gotten large, yes. Okay, then that might be it. Yeah. They might I just, just need to go in and separate them? Yes, and you would you can do it any time after they should have flowered. 
And make sure you plant them at the right height as well. Would not be too recommended, deep. not too deep. Yeah. Now they plant, they flower. Those are rebloomers. They're ever bloomers. They flower all summer long. Mm -hmm. Yes. So she should divide but them. She has nothing going on. So yeah, I might I, as well do it now. Yeah, might as well. Wait till it's not the hottest day, or really windy, but. Um, and they won't look pretty once you divide them. But mm -hmm. if you know, if you well, want to wait, she and do cut it in the, the fans fall. off. Um, when she divides them, cut some of the leaf surface off. Yes, you can do that for iris, so I don't know why you couldn't do it for daylily. Remove some of the leaves. You could also do it in the fall, but. The bottom line is it's exceedingly hard to kill a daylily, so <laughs> you can probably do almost anything. And <laughs> they and grow on well gravel. <laughs> yeah. But Stella Doro just should be in full flower, so I would definitely get those divided and smaller. Okay, well, uh, that is a quick show. Thank you so much for watching, and I want to thank you three. I'm glad we had the bug guy here. We yeah. had a lot of bugs questions. I uh, hope that you have a great week gardening, and we will see you next time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.